Hello, and welcome to episode 24 of series 5 of the Engaging Internal Comms podcast. This is the show for employee engagers and internal communicators who like to keep up to date with all that is new in our profession. My name's Craig Smith from The Big Picture People. Welcome again to the Engaging Internal Comms podcast. If you're a new listener, you will find over 100 episodes available at our website, which is thebigpicturepeople.co.uk. If you go to the website and you click on the podcast tab, you will see all of the podcast episodes going back all the way to 2020, which you can listen to consume there. And that's where you'll get the best listening experience, regardless of which platform you're listening on now. On the website, we have links on our show notes. We have a full show note for each episode. And we also have links to our guests and any media that they reference in their interviews itself. Also on the website, you'll find links to our products and our services, our visual communication tools, our explainer videos, and our other internal communications products. So that's the best place to visit if you are new to the show or if you want to get the full podcast experience. Anyway, let's move into the topic for this episode's interview. A lot of the internal communications professionals we speak to and deal with are often responsible for coaching and supporting their leaders to help them to be able to present company information, whether that's at a town hall meeting or as as part of a, a regular company update process or regular communications process. So we're going to be exploring what we can do to help our leaders be more effective in their communications, particularly in a presentation situation to groups of people. And we're going to be looking at why presence presentation and persuasion are should all be fundamental parts of that process of preparing to deliver a presentation and we're going to be looking at another three principles as part of that which is all about knowing your audience having an explicit ask and then creating a dialogue which i guess are really resonate for all of us anyway in all of our internal communications work they're three key elements of that so we're going to be speaking to someone who works with c-suite leaders in large organizations coaching and supporting them and we're going to be learning from some of their insights and tips as to how we can help our leaders with presence persuasion and presentation. My guest today is Valerie Di Maria. Valerie has earned recognition as a communications and marketing leader and executive coach at both global corporations and PR agencies. Today, as principal and co-founder of The Ten Company, a strategic communications firm, she helps C-suite executives transform their businesses through authentic, results-driven external and internal communications. Her coaching work enables senior executives and high potentials to enhance their leadership, presentation, and risk-taking skills. Her clients include Aspen, Insurance, EY, KPMG, Merrill Lynch, New York Life, and State Street. Previously, Valerie has held a chief marketing and communications role at GE Capital, Motorola, and Willis. So hello, Valerie. How are you? Hello, Craig. I'm great today. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing really well, Valerie. Thank you so much. And just for our listeners, whereabouts in the world are you, please? I am in New York City, Lower Manhattan, to be specific. Fantastic. And I think even those of us with limited knowledge of the United States geography know where Manhattan is. So, uh, yes, wonderful, wonderful memories of my my two brief visits to Manhattan. So um, tell us a little bit more about your, your work and career. I've, I've given a kind of fairly extensive uh, introduction to you there, Valerie. Do you want to tell us a little bit more, more in your own words? Yes, and thanks for the lovely introduction, Craig. Uh, So I started the 10 company 12 years ago after my corporate work, and I'll go back to that in a second. Mm -hmm. We are a full-service marketing and communications firm, and we do three big areas of work. Area number one, external communications, thought leadership, media relations, crisis communication, social media work. Second big bucket is employee communications, both in terms of strategy and execution. And the third is executive coaching, which I know we'll talk a little bit more about during this session. Uh, I was probably one of the few people that started out in high school knowing Hmm. they wanted to do communications work. Back then, we had a career day and we had a woman who owned a local PR agency come and talk to us. And I thought, Hmm, this is an interesting combination of strategic and creative skills, and I think this could be for me. And then it went from there. The first half of my career was at major agencies like Ketchum and 
uh, Porta Novelli, and then I wound up running GCI Group globally when it was part of Gray Advertising, and then yeah. went on the corporate side, as you noted, with uh, GE, Motorola, and Willis. Yeah, and always always based around New York area, or have you moved around the states or around the world with 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 your roles? Well, my corporate jobs and my agents' jobs are very global, so I mm. have traveled and done communications in almost every major market, but Mm. primarily stayed in the tri-state area. But when I was head of communications for Motorola, I was in Chicago for a few years. Yeah, yeah, okay, fantastic, fantastic. So, so we're going to be exploring this, um, this, this idea of presence, presentation, and persuasion. These are your, these are your three Ps that you shared with me when we were, we, we originally uh, had our pre- preparatory conversation, uh, and we're even going to add an, a, a, a further P to that in the title of this, which is perfecting presence, presentation, and persuasion. So, before we dive into the details of each of those, do you want to kind of just trying to give us a little heads up on on what each of those are and how that's significant and relevant to the kind of work that you're doing now, uh, Valerie, please. Yes. Well, it's really all about helping executives at any level from high Mm. potentials up to CEOs be better communicators to their audiences. So it's not necessarily getting people ready for the global speakers bureau circuit where they're doing major keynotes every week, which we do, but this, that's not the normal uh, course of action for your average executive. So the whole idea is how do they come across with credibility? How do they speak well and clear about their messaging? But the persuasion piece is the most important because w- this is all about influencing people. What do you want people to do as a result of your talking with them? Do you want employees to adopt and embrace a new strategy? Do you want your organization to work more collaboratively? Do you want your investors to invest more money? So it's all about Mm. persuasion, not just about being an an elegant presenter. Yeah, yeah, no, I thought that's I think that's a really important distinction. And I guess, I guess, be, again, before we go into the details of those, each of those three areas, Valerie, I guess you, you know the, the 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 way that we we probably, in my mind, when you're saying that, I'm kind of envisaging, you know, the kind of the the, the town hall. I'm I'm viewing the kind of the big conference where the the kind of the leaders up there on the stage. But I guess that's changed, hasn't it, over the last four or five years with the with the advent of of, of you know more more use of of and a frequent use of video technology. And, and, and video streaming and obviously zoom and teams and that sort of thing is the sort of the work that you do both in in that kind of i guess not more day-to-day context but that kind of getting those messages across and that presence or is it still primarily in a kind of physical face-to-face environment it's really in any environment because the principles of being a good communicator are the same whether you're talking to a thousand people or literally sitting across the table from somebody in your office. Mm. And we do discuss specifically in-person context and how to be effective, but also, of course, as you noted, virtually. And in fact, Mm. during COVID, we created a whole training just about being a better presenter virtually because that's what everybody's doing. But of course, now that people are going back to their offices, they're still definitely, you know, doing video and yeah. doing things virtually. So the principles are the same and we really try and enforce good practices that work in any scenario. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the C-suite leaders that you typically work with, and I know that's kind of, you know, very, a very diverse group of people and we're kind of, you know, without want to kind of, um, you know, kind of say that they're all the same. I mean, do you tend to find that they have an appreciation of this need? Do they tend to sometimes over overestimate how good they are or how effective they are? Do you, do you often find you're pushing against an open door when you're when you're working with, with people? Or do you do you sometimes have to help them to understand, you know, what they don't know themselves and kind of help them to kind of realize their own kind of development needs? Yeah. It's really, Craig, across the board. Uh, mm. Everyone is different and we have some CEOs and other executives who are overly confident and some Hmm. that need to definitely become more accomplished. Hmm. And so we usually can help whoever it is in some way enhance what they're doing. It is interesting, not everybody readily acknowledges how important being a communicator is. We Hmm. worked with a new CEO at a major cable company, for example. And when he became CEO, he just was shocked at how much time he had to spend 
presenting to mm. internal and external audiences, which sounds, uh, you know, mm. funny in a way, but it's true. Yeah. So yeah. it really depends. Luckily, as you and your listeners know, there's so much research out there that reinforces the importance of being a good communicator. Uh, McKinsey did a study that says effective communications can increase a team's productivity by 20 to 25 percent. A recent study from the USC Annenberg School said 70%, 70 percent, 70 percent of the variance in the scores mm. of employee engagement is caused by leaders. So mm. we, if we need to, we kind of get out all the research to show yeah. them that this is yeah. really important. Mm. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, you know that, that, that's great, and thank you. That, I think that's an important point to emphasize. So let, let's let's dive into presence, presentation, and persuasion. So, again, did, you you mentioned earlier that, that that you know these are these are kind of just some of the some of the ingredients, I guess. Do you want to let's shall we deconstruct them one by one and just maybe just give our listeners a little bit of a flavor for some of the things that you would focus on in on each of those three different areas? Um, maybe starting with pre presence, I guess, is the first one on your list. I'm a I'm imagining that's the kind of the, the uh, and is there a hierarchy or is there a sequence to them uh, the way that you, you should teach and train them? Uh, well, there isn't really a sequence. And as I mentioned, persuasion is the most important. Yes. Uh, mm. Presence, of course, is how you come across. We, mm. you know, what, how you look, how do you work a room? How do you look on video? Mm. How, what your tone of voice is? Are you engaged? Are you energetic? Are you high energy? Those types of things. Mm. Presentation is really the messaging, which is the most important thing. There is no substitute for having great content and mm. knowing your content. We always say you cannot use notes. You must know your material. Yeah. And yeah. the third is persuasion, which, uh, as I've already said, is the most important. I would say across the board, the three most important principles, if your listeners take nothing else away from our coaching work, the three most important things are number one, know your audience. And that seems obvious, but it, you'd be surprised at how much more digging people should do before they talk to, right. to folks. Number two is have an ask. What do you actually want? The, mm. Either the person you're talking to or the employees at a town hall you're talking to or the investors on an investor call, what do you want them to do? Have a specific ask and then make it a dialogue, which mm. is to me the most important thing. Nobody just wants to listen to somebody talk, 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 talk. You must engage your audience throughout, throughout your presentation, not just at the end with questions, comments, a real discussion. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, what, what are some of the, uh, I, I, I like that. And, 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 and let's maybe just, just drill into those a little bit more then. So, so in terms of knowing your audience, you said there, there's always more you can do. And I guess, you know, I, I know from experience, you kind of, I, I deliver a lot of training and, and I've, I, I've worked at conferences and you kind of think, you know, what, where the frame of mind, you know, you know, what kind of where people are coming from. What, what, what are some of the tips that you give to your clients when it comes to like that digging into really understanding people's needs and, and knowing that audience? One is don't assume anything, even if they're <laughs> your colleagues that you worked with for the last 10 years, mm. you may not know them as well as you think they do. We did a training with a group of people for New York Life, the uh, insurance and finance company, and they work together, but one of the gentlemen was a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, and he brought leadership lessons from the Navy to New York Life, but yet none of his colleagues knew that about him. So mm -hmm. start with bios either online within your company. LinkedIn, I still think, is the preferred business communications social media platform mm. look up people on linked on linkedin where do they go to school who do they follow mm. get try and get inside their head we sometimes send little questionnaires out if we're doing a training for example to the folks we will be working with to get a feel for what their experience is, what they already know, what do they want to get out of the session. You could do that with any kind of a meeting that you have. Mm. You might, when you send the invite out, even put two or three questions in the meeting invite. Not everyone may answer, but you still might get some nuggets. If you can't get to people easily dire directly within a big corporation, for example, if you're meeting with a new CEO, you might want to get to their head of HR or their chief of staff mm -hmm. in advance to say, 
okay, we're going to be meeting with Sarah next week. We haven't presented to her or haven't met with her. What is she like? What doesn't she like? Can you give us some, some feedback? So as much information as you can get about the individuals you're talking with, the better. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, and I know that, again, I know it from a slightly different context, but when I'm working with, you know, when I do a, some of my facilitation work with teams, it's for me that's really important to know where they're coming from because often the, the commissioner of that piece of work has asked you to come in and do something, but I know from experience that might not be what the rest of the group think is the best use of their time. Exactly. And I know it's slightly different with a presentation because you, you're kind of there to, you know, deliver a particular message, which, which, you know, as you, we've talked about is going to be persuasive and, and influential, but, but I think, it, you know, understanding where they are at, you know, mentally, physically, but also kind of the, you know, the kind of their, their state of mind and how receptive they're going to be, particularly in this takes us on to the next part, I guess the ask is, is really, really key, isn't it? To that, to that sort of, you know, not dying on your feet and, and, or versus having a really kind of a good connection with your audience. Yes, exactly. And we talk about having an ask, but it, sometimes it doesn't really register with people. What we're saying is literally Tell people at the beginning of your presentation talk what you want them to do. We mm. want you to take away three new ideas that you can go back and implement in the next month or whatever yeah. it is. Be very specific because people will listen to you differently if they understand what the expectation mm. of them is. So I'll give you an example. We were coaching a group of auditors to do a presentation to their leadership for one of our clients. And they did a rehearsal for me and they started out with the history of the audit department. And then they talked about the people on the audit team. And then they talked about all the projects they had worked on that year. And then the last piece was about a new audit process. And that was really why they were having the meeting. They were, they developed a new audit process and they wanted approval and input. And so I said, no, 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 we, you have to re-engineer this order. You start with the new audit process. The ask mm -hmm. is, we have devised a new way to look at how to do audits. Today, we want your input and your approval to move forward and roll this out in the next quarter. Mm -hmm. Here are the yeah. three reasons why this is better, and then go into that. And then the rest of the information can unfold in a dialogue. They can ask you if they want to know more information about your team. Mm -hmm. So that's the other reason why the dialogue piece is so important is you don't have to give them everything, all the information up front. It gets kind of tedious and too detailed oriented mm -hmm. in, in general. Get your ask, the information that's imperative to get the ask done and then go into the discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, li I like that. I, I remember I remember when I did presentation training, this is going back a long time now, and, and, I can't, I, and a bit that always stuck with me was, is the, and it, it's, I, I guess it's similar to what you've just said there, is the, 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 the person who was present, who was training us was said, you know, think about the, the when you watch the news channel, what happens is, uh, you know, they kind of give you the headlines, they tell you what, what, what's coming up in the main body of the, of the, of the, uh, of the show, then they tell you that information and at the end they kind of recap at what they told you so he's you know like, tell them what you're going to tell them tell them and then tell them what you told them uh, and I, I used to always, always stuck with me which is that you know I think the tendency which is to sort of you know kind of start with some sort of ambiguous woolly concept and then sort of ta-da here's what I want you to do now as a result of all of that stuff and people don't always necessarily follow that logic flow but as if you you kind of warn them what's coming you give them the reasons and the kind of the, all the evidence they need that and then you kind of remind them what you need them to do or you you you, know, you kind of open it up to that, that exactly. kind of action. You start with the answer what I say this is not <laughs> the latest sequel to Knives Out where you reveal at the very end of your presentation <laughs> yes. that the butler did it in the library mm. with a knife. Mm. You tell mm. them right up front the butler did it and here's yes. why and here's what you need to do with this information so yeah. it's it's you want to engage your audience and storytelling is great but it isn't necessarily a linear process yes yes definitely just just just, just before we move off that there then so the, the the thing that you mentioned there about dialogue and i guess again a lot of presentation 
you know, a lot of people still live in their head that presentation, although, you know, I'll open it up to Q&A at the end is, is very, it's very one way. It's very kind of transmitting, whereas obviously you're, you're talking here about much more of a kind of a dialogue. Uh, what are some of the things, I guess, the, the, the ways to encourage that dialogue, but also maybe some of the watch outs? Because again, I've seen presentations where, you know, questions are welcome from the go and before you can't even get started before there's, there's loads of questions and hands going up and people just don't know how to handle that. How do you get that dialogue piece right? So it actually, it's at the right moment and it's actually in the right spirit of what you're trying to do with a dialogue because if it's you know as i said if it just sort of from the get-go you kind of just got lots of questions it it can kind of derail your flow what are your thoughts on that valerie well my overall thought is i would so much rather have too many questions than have nobody <laughs> say anything because yeah. you wonder is anybody out there does anybody yeah. even care about this i i don't mind too much interaction. Let's put it that way. Yes. What we recommend is that people start, as I mentioned, with the ask and mm -hmm. have three key messages. People remember things in threes, make mm -hmm. it easy for your audience to mm -hmm. remember. So front load the most important information and then the rest literally can flow with Q&A. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, I... I don't have time. I won't get through all my material. Well, then you probably have too much material. If they mm. give you 20 <laughs> minutes on the agenda, you should not have 10, 20 minutes of talk track. You should probably have 10 minutes of talk track that you planned mm. for. So you've built in the time for the questions and the discussion. Mm -hmm. And our point of view is not just any questions, any questions, because a lot of times you do that and there are crickets, you know, it's, yeah. it's you know, what come prepared with questions you can ask your audience that will elicit a response. What are your biggest concerns? What are you seeing our customers uh, doing? What do you think, do you have suggestions on how we might do this in a better way? So come prepared with questions to spark a dialogue. That I yeah. think is very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, it, it always, um, you know, when you kind of, I bet anyone got any questions and then, you know, the hand goes up and the roving mic goes to them and it's actually not a question. It's just a, like a long winded statement. And I always, I always find that, you know, when I, whenever I'm facilitating a Q and A for a presenter who hasn't really kind of thought about how they're going to do it themselves, I'll always kind of, you know, get them to maybe the, the people to kind of write down their questions and share those, you know, kind of, so we know it's a question rather than just, you know, uh, either a contradictory statement or, or or a supportive statement and, and making sure you know and I always push back and say that's interesting but what's your question and making sure that people appreciate it's got to be you know a question to make make it a proper dialogue um, I mean what are your experiences with that in terms of again I know we're talking now more about facilitating Q&A rather than interaction and dialogue which is what you what you're kind of alluding to there but have you got any particular thoughts about that because I know that can be quite fearful for people yeah, a couple of things. So I, I I find that most executives spend a lot of time preparing slides if they're presenting, mm. some time on their talk track, and not nearly enough time anticipating the questions. Yeah. Mm. So our suggestion, and sometimes as a coach, we help them with this, is in advance brainstorm all the questions you could be asked, mm. and even more importantly, which questions do you hope you don't get asked because mm. if you're ready for those difficult questions then you're ready for anything yeah and i don't like to limit interaction yes you want to keep the discussion on course i would say if anybody is brave enough to stand up or to call in or to, in the chat give a question or make a comment mm. Mm. i don't like to dismiss it i like to acknowledge it yeah i even say if people are going to disagree now is a good time to get it out challenge me Great. Yeah. Let's have a discussion because otherwise they will leave the room thinking, oh, this doesn't make sense for me or I disagree yeah. with this and you don't have a chance to respond. Mm. So I am very liberal about my thoughts on as much interaction as possible. If somebody is really off topic, you know, you, you say, I see you're passionate about this. That wasn't on the top on the agenda for today. I can give you a very short response, but let's talk afterwards and we could have a better conversation about that topic or let's put it on the agenda for the next meeting. So you don't want to shut it down. You want to acknowledge, be always be concise on your answers anyway, and then see if you can have another opportunity to address a topic if it's really not 
pertinent to the entire group. Mm, excellent, excellent. Yeah, very good, very good. So I know you, you, do, you, you mentioned in your in the intro that you do, you do, um, obviously the type of work that we've just been discussing, but you also do non coaching IC work. You're also involved in in not well, not that that is not not conventional IC work, but 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 but, but sort of non kind of working with exec type IC work. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that, that Valerie? Sure. So we really do a range of work in that area in uh, internal communications, mm. cha big change management programs. So, for mm. example, for Fannie Mae, we worked with the entire technology function to help them understand and adapt agile methodology. The mm. whole idea of not of being uh, open to failure, learning quickly mm. and moving on. So a lot of change management type of communications. We also do, so we do big programs. So we also do little programs. For one of our clients, we help identify inspirational employee stories and mm. interview them on what they've accomplished for the company or in their area. This is for a healthcare company and how other employees can learn from it, write that up and it goes on the company intranet. So one of the things we do because myself and my partner, Claire Ginacola, is a uh, She's a co our co-founder and uh -huh. is the principal with me of the agency. She was previously a CEO of a technology company in the healthcare industry. So right. we bring this C-suite orientation to our work. We understand what it's like to be in the C-suite, and we understand the entire range of what's needed. So we can uh -huh. look big picture, and also we're not afraid to execute and execute well. Uh -huh. Excellent. All oh, right. It's very, very diverse then. So yeah, that sounds really interesting. And um, one thing I wanted to mention yeah. that's mm. brand new that your listeners might be interested in is we just developed a, an AI workshop to specifically ah. help communications teams and business leaders use Gen AI effectively to enhance productivity and creativity in their communications. Mm. So we, it's very it's strategic, but it's also very practical. How do you write a great prompt? How do you really take one asset and be able to create multiple uses for it, whether it's social media posts, internal talking points, et cetera? And then, of course, the risks and how to mitigate those risks, which we are aware of in the AI world. Yeah, yeah. No, that's very, very relevant and very and very contemporary because, yeah, I know it's, it's one of the things that I hear more than more than anything, I think, and I think you're probably the same as – is like uh, we're kind of intrigued by it but terrified by it at the same time and, yes. and also really don't know how to get started with it and and yeah it, it's uh it's definitely something we, we've covered it sort of briefly on the show before and, and and also you know kind of not just as a, 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 a i think originally when i remember few well a year or so ago we were talking a lot about the kind of threat to jobs and you know am i going to be replaced by ai ai whereas i think a lot of people now are seeing it as a really valuable tool but used used appropriately it can also be uh you know it can, can be inappropriately used which is which is to be avoided as well of course right, right. Uh, the quote i've heard is you will lose your job if you don't know how to use ai yes yeah, yeah. Uh, which I think is is interesting. And we have found it to be, I, I make the analogy, it's like the early days of social media, if we could think way back when, when yeah. social media first and people were like, oh, executives, I'm not using that. Nobody's online. Uh, we're not letting our employees comment pub, you know, online, et cetera, et cetera. And look, obviously what's happened now, it's become a way of life. Of course, yes. you always still have guardrails from a corporate point of view, but it's still a very effective way to communicate. And I think that's the way AI is going to go. It's not going to, it's here to stay. It keeps improving and we learn, need to learn how to marshal it uh, effectively and ethically. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, look, we've covered quite a lot of lot of areas there from your kind of expertise, Valerie. And, and anything we've not covered, the the any kind of final nuggets of of wisdom or experience or any top tips that we've not explored uh, in in the in the conversation that we can kind of include within this whole sphere of presence presentation and persuasion and then also the 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 work that we talked about there around the uh, you know the kind of knowing your audience explicit asks and and having a dialogue but anything else to add to that 
Craig, um, Craig, I think you've, this has been a great conversation for me. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I think we've covered it. Know your audience, have an ask, and make it a dialogue. And as I mentioned, it's for your listeners to really have everyone think about how they can help executives across the company be better communicators, be open to communicating with all audiences and not just help them with the messaging, which is obviously so important, but giving them the confidence and the tools to do it well. Yeah, 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 no, definitely. And I, and I mean, I, I, you know, when I was reflecting on that, know your audience, have an explicit ask and make it a dialogue. I think, you know, you obviously use that in the context of, 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 of presentations, but I think that equally applies to so many different areas of communi- communication, internal or otherwise, is, 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 is it, those are the kind of the three key principles, really. And, and I think particularly the one that really, well, they all resonate with me, but the one that really resonates with me is the whole dialogue piece, because I think we still to use uh, internal communications too much as a broadcasting methodology rather yeah. than as a, a way of in, in, encouraging people to sort of join us and, and and enter our world and talk about it and 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 sort of calibrate our thinking rather than just listen to what I've got to say to you and then go away and execute it. It's it's it just doesn't work like that and and you know particularly generation z and and all of the millennial kind of people who are who are now dominating our workforce expect so much more from from uh, from their leaders so i think it was really really compelling so thank you for that well thank you for the opportunity and i've really enjoyed it yeah we're going to share some links in the show notes so for the listeners if if uh, if you're looking for where they are they're on the on the website version of this version of the podcast so if you head across to the big uk and find our podcast page you'll see this interview with valerie and at the bottom of the page you'll see uh, some links there we're going to put valerie's uh, linkedin profile we're going to put a link into the 10 company website so if you want to look at valerie's company website you can have a look at that and also your coaching program for women by women Do, Actually, we've not covered that. Do you want to just say a little bit more about that, please, Valerie? Uh, Sure, Craig. We have a program called Voices. And as a female-owned agency and, as I mentioned, our own C-suite experience, we've translated all of that into coaching specifically for women, Mm. Uh, how to create your executive brand, how to be comfortable speaking up in meetings, how to take more risks, how to look for board positions, for example. So it's a lot of, uh, it's a range of coaching work, but specifically with a eye to issues that, and behaviors that women have that we might want to change or enhance. Fantastic. You're right. Was, and we'll put up a link into that. So that's women, women-voices.com. That's in, in the show notes as well. So, um, well, thank you so much, Valerie. That All that remains is to, for me is to say thank you so much on behalf of myself and the listeners for your for your time and your, and your wisdom and your insights. It's been really interesting. And uh, I wish you all the best for the rest of uh, 2024. Well, thank you. The same to you, Craig, and to all of your listeners. Thank you, Valerie. Bye-bye. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Engaging Internal Comms podcast. If you've got any ideas for episodes you'd like us to cover in future, you can email us at info at thebigpicturepeople.co.uk or you can use the feedback form at engagingic.com. If you're not already subscribed to the show via your podcast platform, please do so. And if you could leave a review for us, that would be absolutely fantastic. We have links to other episodes at engagingic.com. All of our previous episodes are available there. And if you're interested in our visual communication services, our big pictures, our learning maps, our explainer videos, and also our live graphic recording, please get in touch with us again at info at thebigpicturepeople.co.uk. Thank you.